my um, devotion to free speech is not related to my coincidental career in comedy. And he blew a fuse. And he wrote me an email calling me a Nazi propagandist mm. and a sack of shit. Now this is kind of a Finkelsteinian moment. When you unfurl, it looks like a couple hundred pages there, but. Well, I was, I was, I was that, that I was always pretty MAGA. This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's guest is Noam Dwarman, the owner of New York's Comedy Cellar, the most influential and controversial comedy club on the planet. Dave Chappelle, Louis C.K., Amy Schumer, Sarah Silverman, Chris Rock, Andrew Schultz, and many, many others not only broke out from this legendary Greenwich Village hotspot, they regularly returned to try out new material. Trained as a lawyer, Noam is a staunch defender of the First Amendment, and in an era of groveling apologies and censorship on the down low, he remains outspoken on the value and importance of free expression to a flourishing society. His podcast live from the table has guests ranging from Israel critic Normal Finkelstein to atheist Sam Harris to former reasoners Radley, Balco, and Michael Moynihan, and never has a dull moment. We talk about free speech, the history of comedy in Greenwich Village, and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Here is the Reason interview with Noam Dwarman. Noam Dwarman, thanks for talking to Reason. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you have a, uh, you know, you are the, you own the Comedy Cellar and the Village Underground mm -hmm. and one other club in New York? The Fat Black Pussycat. That's right. They're, they're all under the Comedy Cellar umbrella now, but they yeah. didn't used to be. Okay. And uh, so you're taking over this whole part of town and then you have a club in, in Vegas in as Vegas, well. In Vegas, yeah, at the Rio Casino. Is it... Is this a good time for stand-up comedy or the greatest time for stand-up comedy? I think in terms of the, uh, the, the average level of comedy, this is the greatest time there's ever been. Like I could just remember in the 90s, um, most acts were touch and go. There were a handful of acts that were like Jon Stewart that were short things and most acts were touch and go. Now most acts are short things. And then in the higher levels there hasn't been much turnover so the people who were famous you know years ago are still yeah. around uh and you know it's just accumulating chris rock and john stewart and ray romano and alexandra schultz and shane gillis and and there's no churn of it so they're all still out there does that mean people younger people can come up though or is it kind yeah. of like everywhere else where it's like you know there's a lot of angry millennials and gen z like no it seems, there seems to be no barrier to entry especially yeah. now with youtube and um, people just bubbling up on their own what um you know a lot of people talk about how you know wokeness has killed comedy has it or has it changed it i, I don't I don't have not bought into that stuff. It's it's true that woke people have objected to comedy, like woke people objected to Dave Chappelle. Woke people uh, kicked Nimesh Patel off stage at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And they kept Shane Gillis from getting okay, a slot on SNL. Got Shane right? Gillis, yeah. uh, Simons, who uh, got Shane Gillis fired from SNL. Mm -hmm. But none of these guys have been deterred in their mm -hmm. careers. Their careers are as big as they've ever been. Um, there was that. Uh, thing going around during the Chappelle controversy when Rotten Tomatoes, like the critics were giving him a 30% and the public gave him a 99%. Yeah. So, I, I worry about Dave Chappelle though, you know, because, you know, one bad review and his life could be over. Yeah, yeah, right? he's, done. <laughs> he's so yeah. fragile. Uh, um, so I don't, and then uh, there's a whole new crop of comics who seem to have benefited by just breaking this this taboo of wokeness, mm -hmm. like Shane Gillis and Andrew Schultz and uh, Tim Dillon, and they're bigger than anybody. So, um, you know, you you mentioned a bunch of uh, you know guys, not all white, but guys, and then you know, just off the top of my head, I can think of people like Tiffany Haddish and Amy Schumer and Sarah Silverman, who are going gangbusters. At the lower level, is there as much kind of uh, you know, uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, all of that, uh, you know, uh, and are women participating in comedy, you know, the way that men are? Yeah, so at the lower level, there's been a drastic change in the ethnic makeup of uh, the comedy community. There's every shade, there's uh, gay, there's trans, um, Indian comics, Asian comics, 
the number of women has increased, but not uh, not in the drastic way that the number uh, that the ethnic ratio has changed. There just seems to be fewer women attracted to stand up comedy. I had chalked it off at times. This is and this is very people get very upset about this. Uh, Christopher Hitchens got you know all that mm -hmm. trouble, but. Um, just like how many women are class clowns growing mm -hmm. up. There just seems to be fewer women who are attracted to that expression. Right. I don't think there's, I, I don't know what goes on at other clubs, but it's certainly not at the comedy cellar. It's not a barrier based on their sex. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we're hungry for funny women because we do get complaints from time to time. Somebody saw a show and they said, well, I wish there were more women on the show. And it's true. I mean, like, you, you know, in a, in a way, I mean, there can be genres like gross out comics or kind of brainiacs or whatever. But like, I know when Amy Schumer kind of emerged, that was like, that was cool because I don't think guys would have been talking about things the same way. And it's very funny. Yeah. Women are hungry to hear funny female comics. And the ones who are funny, like Amy Schumer, like Ali Wong, yeah. destroys. Like you can literally feel the, 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 the room shake. So the ones who are funny, it's not like the audience is not accepting them. They're what's the fewer of them? What's the what's the power of being in a club as opposed to either a giant theater, um, you know, like Radio City Music Hall, or watching on a TV show? Like why, you know, why you run? I mean, the Comedy Cellar has what, like 150 seats. It's a pretty tight space. Yeah, 100, 140. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and it's like, you know, like I, you know, why is that great? Why? What is unique and powerful about that? Uh, these are probably all psychological issues. One is that there's a, we get energy from being in tight spaces, close to people, shoulder to shoulder, L laughter and, uh, and vibes. Vibes are real, people pick up on them. And then, uh, so that's in the audience. And that's like any party, you know, like a, uh, my father used to say, the best decoration is people. There's just something about being around people. And then, there's a certain distance and it's a magic distance because we struggle with it in the village underground where i think we actually some seats go beyond this distance there's a certain distance from talking to somebody mm -hmm. where you just you're not uh, captivated in the same way maybe it's you can't pick up on the subtle cues of their face mm -hmm. i don't know exactly what it is but in a small room everybody's close enough to the comedian that they are getting the full impact of them. This doesn't happen in a bigger room. It doesn't happen in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, it's just it's and I'm this. I'm sure it's just some primitive reaction. What uh, has how has you know questions like you know political correctness or wokeness or an intense focus on identity politics? Um, you know, does you know has that stopped people it hasn't stopped people from doing ethnic humor and and sex humor uh, and whatnot but how has it changed it well white males are doing less of it for sure they feel uh that uh, you know it, except for on, on youtube and stuff like that they're definitely um deterred from that um but other people feel and seem to be protected so for instance, there's one female comedian at the club who does a really like harsh uh, caricature of a Korean nail salon mm -hmm. with the accent. And, it, and, and I'm like, I haven't seen anything. It's almost like Don Rickles level. Yeah. You know? And I look and I watch very carefully the Asian people in the audience to see if they're offended. And they're laughing. And she's not Asian. No, she's, okay. she's yep. a Jewish woman. And they're laughing. And, and for some reason, they, they accept it from her. And I don't think they would accept it from a is white that, male. Yeah, is that a, um, is, you know, sometimes comedians like to talk about how, uh, you know, in this, there's the sanctified or sanctimonious version of this with Lenny Bruce, where, you know, they are puncturing the hypocrisy of, of, of society and whatnot is, what is the function of kind of ethnic humor, do you think? Or is there a function of like kind of in your face, ethnic, sexual, transgressive humor? Well, look, Abigail Schreier wrote something about this in her recent book. The fact is it's natural for us to want to make jokes about things we all notice. And we do all notice ethnic groups and we do all notice their characteristics. And it's, it's, um, it requires enforcement and almost brainwashing to to convince humans 
that they shouldn't make jokes like that. You know, that's without regard to being mean or cruel or whatever it is. Yeah. And sometimes they they verge on cruel, whatever. Um, but uh, there's another layer to this. It's not exactly an answer to your question, but did you see that animated series like Queer Patrol or something on Netflix? I did not. There was this uh, like a gay superhero LGBTQ crime fighting team. Right. And I only saw the trailers on Netflix and the, it was all uh, prominent uh, gay comedians who were the writers. So they had free reign to make any jokes right. they want. And they trafficked in exactly the same cliche, mm -hmm. take it in the butt, you know, yeah. all the same gay jokes that would be totally unacceptable out of, a, you know, a, a straight white male's mouth. So it was interesting that these were still the jokes they found funny. Mm -hmm. It was still the things that they joked about themselves. Like Jews make the same kind of jokes amongst themselves that we get upset about from the outside world. And Can you tell one of those jokes right now? I'm not going to tell, but, you know, okay. but, 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 but it, you know, don't be such a Jew. Yeah. Like, it's like the most common thing in the world for Jews right. to make fun of each other about a concern about money yeah. or, or, or anything like, like that. Um, I mean, I do know some of them. I just don't want to take the time to tell them. But do uh, you do you think we're coming out of this phase of hypersensitivity? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing because you, do you it can know be the famous punchlines like he had a hat, you know, about the the Jewish lady on the beach, and God takes the child, and she begs for the child back, and then God delivers the child back, and she looks. I'm really condensing, no. it, and she looks at the child, and she says, "Oh, thank you, thank you." Yeah. He had a hat, yeah. like about being a, being a pig, kind of, yeah. being a chazer, right? Jewish. And, you know, this is a classic thing one Jew would say to another to make a point. Right. I mean, whatever. But um, there's all sorts of jokes that every Jewish, that every ethnic group makes about themselves. Mm -hmm. Black people do it. But you don't want to hear it out of the mouth of somebody who's not right. you. So um, you are a big proponent of free speech. Yes. Um, how important is free speech to comedy? Well, it, it, just so you know, my um, devotion to free speech is not related to my coincidental career in comedy. It's a happy coincidence and happiest for the comedians uh, who, who work at the club. But um, obviously it's essential for many aspects of comedy. Not all aspects mm -hmm. of comedy depend on, you know, breaking crossing lines and stuff like that. A lot of comedians, I think, romanticize themselves as uh, warriors. and but Truth of comedy. tellers, right? Hmm? Do truth tellers yeah. and doctors of society, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a little bit self-aggrandizing, although mm -hmm. some comedians are. Right. George Carlin was. Mm -hmm. But plenty of comedians are hilarious and don't do that. But the, um, the idea... I mean, as you know, and you've spoken about and written about, f free speech, it, it, as soon as you give it up, it just begins to collapse on itself. So the idea that they have all this latitude, that they don't have to worry about where the line is, that the club supports them, if they had to constantly worry about saying the wrong thing, it would paralyze them. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of like as an analogy, you ever notice like when Bob Dole or John McCain, when they were on the campaign trail, they were so stiff and awkward. And as soon as they lost the election, they would do interviews like, oh my God, yeah, yeah. Romney too. Like that guy's fantastic. Where was right. that guy? It's kind of like, well, because when they're running for office, they're so worried about saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I always think about that w with comedians, that the, the, the notion that they don't have to worry but as far as the, the the greater free speech battles, I don't I don't really think comedy is the is is ground zero for that. Yeah, what is and you you mentioned that your interest in free speech is not based on you owning a comedy club. You trained as a lawyer. You went to University of Pennsylvania for law school. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know why were you a First Amendment lawyer? Is that what brought you to law? Why you know where does your interest in free no, speech? No, actually, come? I will tell you. Uh, in, in law school, they ask you to volunteer some time to a cause. And at that time, growing up in the village, and really uh, following what my father's concerns were at the time, I went out and volunteered for the gay rights club or whatever mm -hmm. it is, because my father had always felt that at that time, uh, bigotry towards gays was the last socially accepted bigotry. 
And, uh, and what was this? 70s, 80s, something? Well, this was already 80s, but he, okay. I, I grew up that way. My father yeah. was very ahead of his time that way. And so just as a funny, I just had thought about this. So I showed up at the gay rights club and I was so stupid. I thought this was really me a gay rights, like we're gonna work for gay rights. Uh -huh. It was just a meeting club. It was just yeah. like a social club. It was like, it was like grinder, you know? <laughs> so they all look at me and I'm like, yeah. so, I never, so I never went back. Um, so as far as, yeah, for, I, always, uh, I, I always took the First Amendment arguments in law school, but everybody did at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, most law students would have uh, supported the idea of putting um, executions on TV so people should mm -hmm. see the truth about that and saying anything. And they were defending the KKK and Skokie. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if any kid in my class was on the other side of these issues. But then fast forwarding, and I think about that a lot, fast forwarding. Yeah, can I, before yeah, we sure. fast forward, you, you were in law school in the 80s. You, you were born in the early 60s, right? I was born in 62. I went okay. to law school. I graduated law school in 87. Okay. And so you and, you, and you, your father owned what became the Comedy Cellar, uh, and you were a kind of Greenwich Village habitue. So you were really at ground zero of this entire sweep of people really pushing the limits of expression and saying, you know what, we should be free to be whoever we are, whether we're gay or straight, black or white, et cetera, uh, comedians who were really kind of pushing things. But that was part of society too, right? And it wasn't just about uh, free expression, it was also like sexual freedom and all sorts of things. What was driving that, do you think? And, you know, and then we'll talk about what changed, but like, what, why was there that push in post-war America to say like, fuck it, I want to do what I want to do. Well, obviously the, the I, I don't know this from experience, just what I've heard is the explanation. The 50s were buttoned up in tight lace and then with Vietnam and with the 60s and the uh, probably the ratio of so much youth mm -hmm. at the time, which was kind of unprecedented, uh, a lot of things just burst free and also i think that the whole free speech movement and f was intellectually correct and we had kind of gotten to that and the greatest intellectuals i think locked in on it because it was having tremendous results obviously you couldn't fight the civil rights fights without encouraging people to be able to say whatever they wanted to say. Flag burning was associated with Vietnam. So all these causes that the left was worried about at the time required free speech and free expression, which is not the case now. Now right. a lot of the causes require suppressing speech, yeah. right? So let's talk about, you said, you know, through your law school experience, and the, you know, this totally resonates with me, and we're about the same age, but socially, you know, it was like, yeah, no, everything is everything is allowable, right? Certainly to talk about and increasingly different lifestyles, which had been either banned or like cordoned off or, or looked down upon became possible, which, I, you know, generally speaking, that's great. Then that changed. What triggered the change? Oh, another thing I, oh. another thing I thought about was uh, the Parents Music Research Council, Tipper Gore's. Uh, resource Resource Council, yeah, Council. Resource they were trying to Center. They were yep. trying to um, censor song lyrics. That's right. This was considered, I mean, it was Tipper Gore, but it was mm -hmm. considered some right-wing thing. We all rolled our yeah. eyes at it. Um, she wrote a great book called Raising PG Kids in an X-Rated World, and her trigger moment was when she heard one of her daughters listening to Prince's Darling Nikki. Uh, would, and she would recount the lyrics to a kind of dramatic reading of <laughs> Nikki. And by the way, as a parent, yeah, I have some sympathy for that. Mm -hmm. I mean... I, I, I have to say, as a former magazine editor, I have some sympathy for that because Nikki is masturbating with a magazine. Oh, but, you know? and it's like, come on. Um, and they don't do that anymore. Yeah, no. The, there was like this kind of scoffing that the parents in the 50s were, were wrong about Elvis. And, yeah. But then now, you know, when I, my children are listening to like wet ass pussy and watching simulated intercourse, and people say, well, the parents have always complained about what their kids saw. And well, yes, but maybe. Maybe and it's is, not simulated. Maybe there Trust is some me. line yeah. where, uh, but but that's also radically different because, right? To say it's one thing to say, you know what? I don't want my kids watching this, and I want to create a world where they don't. To say we're, we we got to ban stuff or we got to limit 
the public exposure because kids are in the way? Well, the, these are the hardest issues because more than ever, there's really no way to prevent the kids from right. getting it. And the kids are important. And I just kind of cross my fingers and resort to another belief that I have, which is that most of what we become is in our genes hmm. and that we're probably not as susceptible to these influences as we think we are. I know that my kids are seeing stuff that I would have just, would have been very hard for me to access. And certainly not the number of hours and hours that they're able to see it. But what, I, think, you, I just think you be live okay. in you know a, a suburban fantasy land, right? Do you think your kids, given their ex, uh, access or access to the internet and to everything else, are they actually experiencing? Are they seeing more weirdness than you saw roaming around Greenwich Village in the '60s, '70s, and '80s? Well, they're seeing more of it presented not as uh, antisocial. They're seeing more of it presented as normal. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's interesting, they're actually reacting against it. They're, they're already making fun of their woke teachers and they're not getting it from me. They themselves seem to be intuiting, oh, this, come on, this is ridiculous. We can't say this, we can't say that. But that's different, right? Because like on, online they can see, you know, any variety of, of uh, pornography or come across almost anything. But we were talking about when did the belief in free speech and free expression and kind of unregulated, whether it's childhood, which isn't quite right, but unregulated expression, that started to decay sometime in the 90s, right? Uh, and it's where, you know, that's continued. Where do you think, why did people turn against the idea of free expression? How did wokeness or the old form political correctness did, become did it, dominant? Did it stop in the 90s? I mean, in the 90s, um they were still marketing shows as politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, that was still right. a, a, if Bill Maher was putting on a show to attract liberal people, Yeah, you see, you'll never believe what Bill Maher might say. So it wasn't really the right wing, but you expect it from the right wing, you know, that uh, they've always, religious people, that's kind of a constant. But the left didn't turn against free speech until it, what I really seemed to notice it was, you know, sometime during the Obama administration into the Trump administration when it seems to me that when certain issues needed extra help to be rammed down the throats of people, they started to make certain things very hard to talk about. Like what? What are those issues? Well, many, many civil rights issues or, or issues that have to do with crime, for instance, mm -hmm. where the debate about crime, which is associated with, you know, to talk about minorities or affirmative action, the, the arguments can be pretty compelling on the other side. Mm -hmm. And it was much easier to make them off limits, to turn them into racist arguments. And then in some way it began to take on a life of its own. The notion that you could get in trouble for wanting to talk about, this is much later, you know, whether a trans women should be able to compete in sports mm -hmm. with cis women, they would make it transphobic in some way, I think, as a way to prevent you from wanting to, to being able to say, well, what about this fact? What about this? Mm -hmm. There's empirical data here. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the statistics? How could this many people be winning, uh, setting records out of a tiny population? Is, you know, And I think you see that in, in a lot of areas, that the issues that are off limits, I think highly correlate to the issues that have strong arguments Hmm. that uh, people are being prevented from presenting. Maybe not all of them. How do we, uh, how do we reverse that? If, if we believe in free speech, do we, I, and do you think, you know, people are saying, okay, with certain arguments or certain topics. And, by, and, by the way, say, yeah. and we see it, and hey, listen, I'm, I'm very pro-Israel, as you know. Yeah. But we see that reflex among Jews. Right who are trying to get people fired, try, you know, all the various things that 
the same okay. people who are complaining about woke have tr it's just like a natural tactic to now they're trying to make those things off limits the palestinian point of view off limits yeah. so it, it it's that's i think so that's what it is. i and i want to talk a little bit more about israel in a second um and about your podcast which everybody should be listening to or watching if they want to see really robust open debate um, that goes the places that a lot of people are afraid to go. Um, but how do, how do we get back to a world where, you know, people are more comfortable? And this isn't as, it's partly about laws, but it's really more about custom, right? Where people are willing to allow points of view to be heard, you know, that are out there. They don't necessarily, you know, we're not for, you're not in favor of forcing people to listen to anything they don't want to listen to, but... How do, we, how do we get back to a culture that is more, uh, you know, kind of pluralistic and tolerance of difference, tolerant of difference? Well, obviously, um, you know, people that you work with are giving that a lot of thought. It's essential because America, I mean, the America I grew up in was basically 90 something percent white Christian. And there was one substantial minority, which was black people and uh so and and that was simple in a way now if you're going to have 10 percent this 10 percent that 10 mm -hmm. percent that and the basic narratives of each of these 10 percents many of them are like clans who will, will always probably hate each other and uh so it's more essential than ever for them to be able to live, for America to allow these people to speak openly, otherwise it descends into really horrible acrimony and even violence and just an awful way to live. So you're saying, so with, you know, as, as America becomes more diverse and, you know, Gen Z is more varied than the millennials who are more varied than Gen X, than boomers, et cetera, that instead of saying, okay, in order to keep peace, we have to kind of put more things off the limit, off the table. We got to put more things on the table because we have real differences of opinion and ways of living. So this is actually something where comedy does uh, inform me. The culture of the comedy seller, which might be unique, is people bash each other, they yell at each other, they scream at each other, there's no hordes barred about what they want to say, and then they have a drink together and there's no grudges held. This is possible. And, and it can get pretty uh, pointed and hot. But you will be ridiculed, ridiculed if you hold a grudge or come in the next day showing that it bothers you. It's like Keith Roberts said, take it, take it. And this is where we have to go. I, I tweeted with him. We have to start stigmatizing people who are offended and Thick skinned has to become a stiff upper lip. These have to be what we expect from people. Do I don't you, know if it's possible. Yeah, do you? Um, you know, I societies wanna, do come apart. I want to give you a chance to indulge in the worst kind of New York City exceptionalism. Do you think that world you're describing, where everybody is a little bit different and everybody goes after each other based on the, the, the crudest, uh, you know, ethnic, racial, sexual stereotypes, and then it like, you know, you get together the next day and you go back to work or you have a drink or something. Is that, is that what made New York great and by extension America great? Yes, I, I, I would say that, listen, I mock diversity as our strength because that's usually uh, the notion that we should be, diversity should be the goal and, and that, you know, objective standards and all that shouldn't be. But there's no question that in the organic sense, diversity is our strength. And um, the energy and the cross-pollinization and the, what we learn from each other, it, it's, it, I, I think it actually is what makes America great. And, but it's, you know, you were alluding to like making fun and jokes. I think that's what you're alluding to, but it's more than that. Like um, in the 90s, you know, the, the, the show Tough Crowd, mm -hmm. Colin Quinn, that was right. based on the back table of the comedy seller. And there were serious arguments going on there. Dean Obadala, who became the CNN uh, uh, Palestinian spokesman, he and my father would scream at each other, scream at each other. 
And then my father gave him a ride home, you know, and then it, it was a very, and, and um, Bill Burr actually did a uh, interview, uh, I think it was on Barry Katz podcast, where he talked about learning that from my father, that you could have that kind of heated argument with somebody and then yeah. still be friends and, five and it's later. not just about comedy talk a little bit about who was your father because you inherited your second generation comedy club owner at this point who was your father and how does that inform your story and your your worldview my, my father was this kind of force of nature guy he was a self-made man uh born in israel came in 1938 he was a ne'er-do-well he sold brushes. Why did he come to, how old was he when he showed up here and why did he come to the U.S.? He was eight or nine. Um, his parents, uh, they, they, they didn't flee. They just, he, he had an uncle who was a child prodigy uh, who was able to get a job uh, as did, a By the way, here. did he end up being a, an adult prodigy or was he like, eh? No, he was a, he was okay. a, he was a concert master of the MBC's right. Philharmonic Orchestra. You could, Tasha Samaroff was his stage name. He was able to bring the rest of the family over. And um, <clears throat> my father described thinking he was dumb, probably because he didn't speak the language at first. But anyway, uh, until he was 30, he did a, a bunch of jobs badly, always fired. And then he opened a, a small coffee shop and he never looked back. He was a huge success from 1960 onward, mm -hmm. eventually um, luck lucking into the comedy cellar. And he was kind of a genius. He was, uh, he didn't graduate high school, but he was scholarly. And he, and he didn't get it from anywhere. He intuited on his own these concepts of, of having open debate and speech and um, being okay with people who disagree with him, encouraging his Arab employees to speak their minds without fear of you know offending him or whatever it is it's just the way he was and the way he lived and uh you know i was very lucky what so he caught he was uh you know he was in greenwich village he was in greenwich village yeah. you know at the time when the folk music revival really i mean greenwich village for you know over a century has been a kind of meeting place of bohemians uh, and things like that but in the late 50s and then starting in the 60s there was this interesting kind of folk revival uh, and also a comedy revival, I mean, yeah. of clubs and things like that. Um, what was, you know, where did that come from and what was it like growing up in that kind of circumstance? Uh, I don't know where it came from, I don't, but um, it was awesome to grow up in it. it, yeah. it, it we, I mean, it was like the center of the universe, the village in the 60s. Um, my father was, uh, he, his place was more Middle Eastern. He didn't like hippies. Um, he felt that LSD had damaged a lot of people around him, although he, he tried LSD. He acknowledged um, that the Beatles were, you know, great music and stuff like that. Dylan was a guy who used to come into his uh, coffee shop. He did not like when Dylan played. Yeah, years later, Dylan would come into the olive tree, which is the are now, almost just to rub it in my father's face. like. Hey, Manny, I'm Bob yeah. Dylan. <laughs> you know, what you were did, wrong. What did he not like about uh, Dylan? Well, okay. He was not, and I'm actually the same way. He was not very interested in lyrics in general. He, and and uh, a huge part of Dylan is the lyrics, right? For him, music, lyrics were nice, but music was the notes and the sound. And the lyrics could be Moon and June. He, it, it would still be beautiful music to him. And Dylan, in, especially in the early 60s, had a very harsh harmonica that kind of got yeah. stuck on everything. So, so my father understood music, and he, he thought the harmonica playing was amateurish, which it was. And he thought his voice was uh, not traditional, although that's probably not why he didn't like Dylan, because my father wasn't a snob about that. And, uh, and he just, he, the harmonica probably more was uh, annoying to him. And he just didn't, didn't like Dylan. And, I, and when Dylan started being treated as a genius, it irked him no end, to, to, you know, he, he, to the extent that if I wanted to listen to Dylan, I would make sure my father didn't know because I knew it would bother him. Yeah. What did you like about Dylan? Well, I actually, I enjoy some of the lyrics, but I, I actually think that Dylan's melodies, although they're quite simple, a lot of them are very good, you know. You hear them like 
converted into Muzak, mm -hmm. and they're they're good whistling melodies, no less than "You Are My Sunshine" or you know these kind of like old school simple melodies. So I like Dylan. I like that free willing Bob Dylan album. Uh, I like Bob Dylan. I'm not a huge Bob Dylan fan, and when I listen to Dylan, it's not like as a musician to learn to to absorb music like in a heavier sense, but I like him. Um, let's talk a bit about your podcast, Live from the Table. Um, uh, give me the you know one sentence or the elevator pitch. What are you trying to do with Live from the Table? Well, it, it it's exactly how should I say? It? It's it wasn't my idea to start it. At first, it was supposed to be interviewing comedians, and then. I realized that because I had a podcast, I could call up someone who had a column at the Wall Street Journal and say, hey, would you like to come in and discuss? And this was a dream come true because I could actually now talk to these people who wrote these columns that I thought would be out of reach forever. So that's quickly what it became. And, it, it, um, and so the, the uh, mission statement now of the podcast is kind of like to debate whatever is going on. But it also was a revelation to me because what I found was, and I know you won't disagree, it's a world of empty suits. I had always thought that someone who wrote for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, when they wrote an argument that didn't seem right to me, I said, well, what do I know? I mean, they're writing for the New York Times. They must have so much more behind it. And then they'd come on the podcast and it turns out they didn't. They, they actually would would stutter and stammer and they didn't actually have a, a, a logical argument. And I still suffer from a lack of confidence even to this day. I think that's just in me. But it did change my entire view of the world that I just don't have that um, reverence for people who write opinions anymore or, or people who tell me anything anymore. That's a, that's a good thing though, right? Yes, don't you yes. think? Because it's, it's a step towards reality. You had a kind of celebrated episode with Philip Bump related to this. Can you summarize who he is and what you guys were arguing about and why you felt he didn't bring his A game? Yeah, well, I had, I had been doing a lot of reading for a long time about this Hunter Biden laptop issue. And this is during the campaign. I said, what are they talking about? We already knew that the FBI had an evidence number. There was so much to it that was obviously not being discussed honestly. And I asked Mike Pesca, you know Mike mm -hmm. Pesca, I said, who is the guy, the smartest guy on this Hunter Biden issue? Because I think these arguments are going to fall apart. I never read. So, and you're, you're thinking when you're reading this stuff, like this is Hunter Biden's laptop and it has something important on it. It was Hunter's laptop yeah. that Devin Archer had, had uh, mm -hmm. damaged the, the whole story. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, it, that, that, that it wasn't just kind of Russian interference, uh, you know, in the election. Yeah, and, 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 and that know, there was real yeah. corruption right. going on. And by the way, I'm not like you should impeach Biden or that yeah. he's, he's making policy to please the Chinese. I'm, I'm not going yeah. that far. But there's a huge amounts of money changing right. hands. And the, the president of the United States is getting on the phone and facilitating it while he's in charge of Ukraine, he, aware that the people in Ukraine are seeing this and mm -hmm. assuming that the fix is in, which would mean hands off on Burisma. This, this, anyway, you could listen to the podcast a little while. And, um, but I'd never actually read a Philip Bump column. And, but I did say to myself before the podcast started, he may walk out. It's the only time I ever had that premonition mm -hmm. that he that this guy is going to get destroyed. I, I just had this feeling like there's just no way he knew what he was walking into. And sure enough, it's, it's exactly the way it happened. And I don't think I ever raised my voice to him. I was nice to him, but he, he freaked out and basically just, just walked out. And then I didn't clip it out. I even sent him a nice email the next day, like, let's have lunch, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I, but some guy on the internet uh, took a clip of it and it went viral. Right. At the same time, Phil Bump had subtweeted me. I don't know what the terminology right. is. He tweeted about me without using my yeah. handle. Said did a did a podcast by some imbecile or some word like that. He said he thought he had me, but it, it didn't gain any traction. This is what yeah. Phil Bump had. Hmm. So, um, how had do you feel? And, how do you feel about that? Is that is that what you were looking for, or no, no? I mean, I, I enjoy the the. Um, I mean, Megyn Kelly did a show about mm -hmm. it. Scott Adams did a show about it. It was, it was all over. I, my, my, 
my kids were very proud of seeing that daddy was in the news and stuff, and I enjoyed that. Um, but no, I, I would have preferred that he was still a friend of the show and came back again. Yeah. He was Listen, he wasn't nice. He did badmouth me. He did everything that I think is what. Not- what was it that you were bringing up that he was like? Not just like I'm going to engage you and defeat you, but I'm I'm done. Well, I played in my clips of Devin Archer's testimony, where Devin Archer was wouldn't buy into the answers. He said, "Well, isn't it true that uh, Barisma wanted uh, the, the Shokin fired his?" And Devin Archer would say. Well, that was the narrative we were given. And I would say, well, who, who talks that way? You'd say, yeah. yes, if that's right. When you say that's right. not the narrative we were, that's the narrative we were given, what you were saying to anybody who has the honesty to listen to it is saying, no, mm-hmm. that was just the party right. line. And there were a number of these things, Devin. So he started getting very aggravated about that. He kept saying, there's no evidence, there's no evidence. Mm-hmm. And at the end I said, well, what about these text messages where Hunter complains that he has to give half his money to his father. Hmm. And, and then he just kind of blew a fuse. I'm like, that's yeah. evidence, you know? And, and I said, shouldn't somebody ask them about that? Right. I, I just don't want anybody to think I'm like some fire-breathing, yeah. MAGA, hunter. Yeah, what, by... what are your politics? Do well, you vote? I don't vote, no. Um, my politics are- Why don't you vote? I used to not vote because it, 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 there was not a single election that was close in an mm-hmm. electoral college system. Um, and then now I don't vote because, I mean, for still for that reason, but as I do a podcast now mm-hmm. and I have to argue and take sides, I am aware that by voting, I am putting a psychological pressure on myself to want to still uh, take the side do of the particular- Do you consider yourself left-wing, right-wing, liberal, progressive, libertarian, conservative, I'm, I'm, I think whatever? I'm, I think I'm pretty libertarian. Yeah. And I'm- and, Economically uh, as well as certainly on a civil libertarian side. I mean, you're a small business owner, right? Yeah, all, all business, owner, business owners are pretty yeah. libertarian economically. Not that I want to see anybody uh, abused. The, the only- no, that is the world libertarians want, right? It's not enough to have our own property. We want to abuse people. Um, where, where am I? Uh, I? I don't think people, and this, um, uh, what Richard Epstein disagrees. He's yeah. you know, a libertarian uh, uh, Law lawyer. He calls I, himself libertarian. Yeah. I, I would prefer that employers couldn't, were not allowed to fire somebody for any beliefs that they express. Mm-hmm. I would prefer that because uh, it would immediately just remove that pressure that people expect somebody to take action, accountability. Epstein thinks that's a bad idea. I think it would bring in a lot of nuisance lawsuits mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Maybe he's right. He's right. thought more deeply about it. But other than that, so I don't want total freedom of action for employers to be able to fire people, but I definitely support at will, I, I don't think you should have to be able to prove that you had cause. How bad was the? Uh, how bad were the lockdowns during COVID for you? You know, running a restaurant and a club or clubs, bars. Um, you know, how how did that work out for you? And did you find New York City and New York State particularly seemingly arbitrary and capricious, or how did that work? Uh, I, I locked, I closed down early. And by the way, this is interesting as a libertarian. I got strong advice from my lawyers and my accountants not to close down early because I might be breaking the law because of my obligations to the employees and blah, 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 that this had to be justified. And I said, but people are getting sick. And at that time, now I was very, I was, uh, I'm always the kind of person who poo-poos threats. But COVID, I took seriously in December of, of uh, 2019, or maybe even November. I ordered gas masks. I mean, uh, uh, face masks. I bought an extra refrigerator. I canceled a deal, a business deal. So I, for some reason, I felt this was real. And uh, two weeks before everything locked down, I was trying to lock down. I was also wanted to pull my kids out of school because at that time, I don't know if you remember. Like the standard for school was, we'll close the school once the first kid gets sick. 
I'm like, well, this is crazy. Why are you waiting for the first kids to get sick? So essentially now, after we know our kids have COVID and they brought it home to grandma, whatever it is, then we'll close the school. So I felt the same thing about my uh, uh, business. So anyway, so I, I tried to close down early and, it, and finally I did. I just said, fuck it, I'm closing down early, sue me. I thought it was the right thing to do. Then I began to think that um, they should allow people to, they should be more free about letting people to open. I, I have a lot of emails, I looked through them where I was suggesting, well, why don't they just require everybody to wear N95 masks? But seriously, not like mm -hmm. just wear, and see how that goes. Sure, Maybe, create like a standard, and then if you meet the standard, you can open, yeah, as and, opposed and, to saying like, you're not a, a, a necessary business, you are, et cetera, things yeah, like I'm, that. I'm a big believer in trial and error. I always say trial and error is worth 20 IQ points. I'm like, they don't really know we see what's going on in Sweden. What if they allowed, if they made, and really enforced it. Everybody has to wear an N95 mask. And let's open up and see if things get worse. If it, you know, and if they do get worse, we could close down again. So that's, that's where I was at. I, I didn't resent the lockdowns. I totally understand erring on the side of caution. At some point, it became ridiculous, obviously. Uh, the, the government doled out more money than it should have to keep us afloat, which I don't think is violates like kind of my, my libertarian principles because it's more like a taking. I mean, they, they're shutting us down and, they, and it also passed through the employees. So I'm not a huge uh, uh, critic of the way we handle COVID. I'm a critic of the way people couldn't discuss it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, yeah. going back to things like couldn't talk about lab leaks, called racist. Again, all the things that there were good arguments. How did they answer those arguments? By making it racist to talk about it. So this is crazy. Let's talk about an, another episode of, of your podcast, which I, I thought was spectacular, where you talked to two Seattle-based comedy club owners who canceled a bunch of uh, uh, comedians who were coming in, including Dave Smith and other members of the Legion of Skanks podcast. Kurt they had, Metzger, yeah. They had booked them. And then they were like, okay, we canceled that. And you had them on to talk about that. What, what happened in that conversation? And, and were you happy with, not, not necessarily with the answers they gave, but like the way that you guys argued about stuff? Yeah, so that was, that was like the opposite of the Phil Bump thing. They were very, very nice. We hung out afterwards. They came to the, to the club. They were excited to see Andrew Schultz, which is ironic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would assume they're not, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Part of their argument was that they had booked these guys without really understanding who they were. And they're in the chop district of Seattle. So it's like a big liberal, you know, kind of woke area. Uh, and their clientele, they were like, yeah, our clientele wouldn't have like this. Right. And do you, I mean, do you think they're accurate in describing what their business is? Or, I mean, you obviously disagree with not I, I booking people. I think it's people, all but. bull. Yeah. I think very few people are actually that offended. I think this Twitter is like uh, the pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're crazy to think that their clientele, some vocal segment of their clientele yeah. will complain. And I know how scary that is, but I've also lived through enough bad experiences like when Louis C.K. came back right. to know that it's it's very distorting of reality. So and with when Louis C.K. this came after he was uh, you know canceled for it came out and he acknowledged that he had masturbated in front of a bunch of women and other ways kind of harassed them and it's it's not fully clear how much you know consent anybody gave or what or, or like there are various degrees of that but he showed up at your club unannounced. And did a set, which, of course, for people in the audience, this is what you come to the comedy cellar for. But you were kind of pissed about that. Uh, oh, I wasn't. I wasn't pissed. I, uh, was I pissed? No, I, I was. Well, and you told the Hollywood Reporter, and it got repeated in Vulture that you were annoyed that he didn't give you any warning. No, I remember. And then I you became part of the story. First of all, a lot of those stories were, were just, just reprehensibly and cynically, they would take a few sentences out of context, including Michael Barbaro who interviewed me and actually edited paragraphs that I didn't say. But there was a time when it, it did get to me where, where, I, where I hadn't spoken to Louis and um, 
or I'd spoken to him once and he had, and he wasn't issuing any statements and he wasn't taking any of the, any of the heat off me where I uttered and I was ashamed of myself to, afterwards that I said, oh, shit, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. You know, and mm-hmm. there was a headline, he's oh, mad at Lucy, yeah. but I was not mad at him for coming back. As a matter yeah. of fact, um, I had given deep thought to what I was going to do when he came back. I'd written an essay about it like three months before he came back just to collect my yeah. thoughts. And, uh, and I felt it was the right thing to do. But then the world came down on me and there were some protests and Twitter. And um, I mean, it seems impossible for me to believe this was my mindset, but I had a meeting with my wife. And I said, well, what if this means we have to sell our house? It was, it was not apparent to me at that time that by taking him and standing up for him the way I was, that I might have to move back into you know, a one bedroom apartment with my kids. And my wife, God bless her, said, I've had less before. That's what, they, that, yeah. was, that was her immediate reaction, which was amazing. Yeah. Are there, who, would you book uh, Bill Cosby? No, I, this, I, yeah. this I, I wouldn't book Bill Cosby because, you know, it'd, that'd be suicide. But, but um, Well, it would be suicide in the sense that the backlash, or is there, or is there a person whose personal behavior either, you know, of which they've been convicted or not, where you're just like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to host this person. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's my business and I would draw my own. I mean, I do everything in my life first and foremost to make myself happy in a way. Like, you know, so including standing up for principle, which yep. makes me happy. But I don't feel that I, as a, as a single business owner, I have to have somebody on the stage who, you know, rape my daughter or, you know, or, or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, so, I, but the, the customers wouldn't accept Bill Cosby. The staff, it would be suicidal. However, it would be very good if America was such a place where if Bill Cosby did perform somewhere now, everybody regarded that as, okay, well, you know, he's, he's free, he did his time. They want, him, they want to hire him, he wants to work and people want to see him. It's none of our business. Yeah. I think that's the way it should be. It's, I, I don't regard it as my business who works where. So um, another great episode that you did um, had Norman Fink. Can I say something about the yep. Seattle? I don't remember yeah, out of yeah, time. Sure. What was shocking about them and, and sad because it was so nice is that they didn't realize that they, they are not going to make it this way. When they, they were picking comics based on their politics, there's so few funny comics as it is. So they're going to get a bunch of like woke, pro, trans, whatever, whatever it is, however they're on stage. And their clientele, which might be significant in that town, will come once to support. But even they won't keep coming back unless it's actually funny. And that was one of the things I was trying to tell them. And most of the time they're complaining about people being offensive or being offended. They're showing off to their friends. They don't really care that much. People care about their families, their children. They don't, there's certain things they don't, care as much as they pretend to sure um another phenomenal episode i thought because of you know there's an airing of real difference in, you know in a concentrated way was when you had eli lake who's now at the uh, free press and norman finkelstein a uh, an academic who is critical of all aspects of israel is also the child of holocaust survivors very outspoken on this did you, do you feel that episode exemplifies what you're trying to do? Yes. And um, the episode was pretty good. I was, again, um, I didn't have the confidence to take on Norman Finkelstein. He's, you know, he's, he's written a thousand books probably just in the time we've been talking. Yeah. And, and, he's, and he's quite bright. Yeah. And he's quite knowledgeable. But, uh, so, and, but that, that episode went well. It was a, it was a good debate. And, and he and I got along very well afterwards. We had dinner together and he wrote me a very nice email where he complimented how sharp I was. And then I wanted to have him back on. And he said, well, I, I don't know if you just come back on the same way is a good idea. How about I come back on and respond to some video clips of people making the best arguments against me? This was his suggestion. I said, okay. So I got Moynihan, Michael Moynihan, and, and Coleman Hughes, and we did an episode called A Response to Norman Finkelstein, where they made very strong arguments mm-hmm. against him. And he blew a fuse. And he wrote me an email calling me a Nazi propagandist mm-hmm. and a sack of shit 
and he called Coleman Hughes a black Shabbos goy, and he refused to come on the podcast. And I, I can show you all the wow. emails. He, he asked me not to release them. So uh, that, that was a sad, and I have a soft spot for Norman Finkelstein because he's very interesting on other subjects. He talks about his past. He talks about his coming to terms with the fact that Mao was a murderer when he was a Maoist. And he actually, I think, shows real introspection. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot, I, I don't want to write him off. I, I actually mm. find him a very compelling character. And I wish, and, and, and then I, I forgot this. I had actually said to him, how about we don't do another podcast? How about we just go out to dinner, you and me? It's because I think the conversation could be more sincere that way. And he wouldn't do that with me either. So there's something mm. about him which is not, I would say missing a screw in some way, at least mm. in terms of the way I think. But he's an interesting guy. Yeah. And and I did I did heavy looks into his footnotes, and he cuts out a lot of uh, exculpatory information. Mm. I would say that about his scholarship. How do you feel on Twitter? I know I'm giving you like uh, uh, not focused answers. No, no. Yeah. That, okay. um, the uh, you know on Twitter and in other things, and you've you've also at the Comedy Cellar, you've hosted a lot of shows and a lot of debates um, that really air things in a way that you know, otherwise wouldn't be discussed. Uh, one of the things that you've been persistently critical of is responses to Israel after the October 7th um, uh, attacks by Hamas. Where, you know, what's your principal concern about the way that we seem to be talking about, uh, you know, the Hamas-Israel war since the attacks? Okay, well, like COVID, one of the only other issues I really felt a lot of trepidation, I was really worried about it, was where the Jewish issue was going in America. And um, I, I was writing pretty pointed emails to a lot of prominent Jews who were on the Trump as an anti-Semite bandwagon and I was alerting them to the fact that sure, some right-wing guy might shoot up like the, the Tree of Life synagogue. Right. But also, you know, there were two synagogue and Jewish center shootings that were foiled during the Obama administration. That, that, you know, that could have happened. I didn't, I thought it was very careless to try to lay this and sloppy to lay it at Trump's feet. And I felt that the right was the bulwark of support for Israel and, uh, and, and worry about anti-Semitism. And it was allowing the left Jews to indulge their social justice id in an ideology, intersectionality, which had to mean, and I wrote this, that had to mean eventually, if, if the shit hit the fan, that the Jews had to be wrong because axiomatically, they're the white people in this conflict. And this scared the shit out of me. And I was um, focused on the fact, and I still am, that left of center Jews or centers of the left Jews are uh, afraid to speak up for themselves. They're uncomfortable in their own skins. And this was making a space for anti-Semitism on the left. Now, the anti-Semites on the left, I don't really think are gonna shoot up a synagogue but they are the elites. They, they, they control the institutions. They are, I, like right now, I sense it. There's like an acid rain of anti-Semitism falling on the Jewish psyche and my kids feel it. They know that being Jewish is something now. They sense it. I hear stories about kids at Columbia Journalism School whispering about going to Shabbat dinner. And this is so foreign to being Jewish when I was that age where I could wear like a Tel Aviv University t-shirt. Uh, 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 another like little clue I had, if you've been to the olive tree, there's a Star of David from an old like Lower East Side synagogue stained glass pane there. And my whole life this was always there and it was always just like an ethnic symbol like a Italian flag at a pizzeria. And sometime five, eight years ago, I began to notice that people were commenting on it to me like, oh, good for you. Uh, you're taking a stand that this was being seen as a defiant gesture in New York City. 
And uh, all of which is to say that I was, I was very alert to this. And then exactly what I feared happened, that the shit did hit the fan and the full weight of intersectionality and then the people who were afraid of being judged by the intersectionality people uh, cowed the Jews and, and have expressed themselves in open anti-Semitism. Can I tell you one more point? This yeah. is important stuff to me. When, like, when I was a kid, when we were kids, Martin Luther King said, uh, can't judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And this was self-evident and easy for an eight-year-old to understand. It was like, of course, you don't, like, it's simple, like two plus two. And later, as I began to see that uh, disparaged and that kind of like the intellectual guardrails, the logical guardrails, which were the reasons that, the, that the, yeah, the guardrails, the logical guardrails, which were the intellectual basis for the argument against bigotry, for the argument against racism, had been abandoned to a new rationale, which was, it's just wrong to discriminate against these people, but we can discriminate against those people if they have power. So we can call you Karen. And, and people say, well, you care about Karen? I say, I don't really care about Karen. I care that it represents a total rotting out of the thinking behind it. And sure enough, this is what's happened now where you're seeing open anti-Semitism, unashamed, because it's okay now. There is, they, these people who are expressing themselves this way, they don't have the intellectual arguments in mind anymore. They actually think that they have license. We saw it in the Kavanaugh hearings. We've heard enough of out of white males from the Senate and um, so now everything's just kind of uh, floating in the now, air. You're, you are not uncritical of Israel in the sense of yes, like... Yes, I am. No, no I'm not well, no, no, but I mean like there are... Th it, you, what you're talking about here is the kind of the idea that Israel has a right to exist and that Jews are... Like define what's the essence of contemporary anti-Semitism as you see it being expressed in America. I think that... <clears throat> There's no one strain of anti-Semitism. Obviously, Larry, Larry David says, that, well, we are a bit much. <laughs> so I, I don't know why there's always been anti-Semitism. If you have a tiny population that rejects the most sacred principle of, you know, a 97% Christian country, and also you're successful. I, I mean, it, many things could lead to anti-Semitism. But there was a principle that, uh, that, um, that opposed it, which was that bigotry was wrong. And that kept it in check in some, I have these feelings, but I know it's wrong to judge people by, by the color of their skin, as it were. That was removed. Not only it's fine to judge people now by the color of their skin, if they can be part of that group, which is okay to judge. And that's, that's, where I, that's what it becomes to the Jews. They were now part of the white power structure that was no longer off limits to saying whatever you want. Why do you think Jews participate in that? You know, it's one thing if you're not a Jew, but you know, but you were talking about how many Jews kind of go along with that. It's infuriating. It's it's part of in, in some way it's some something uniquely Jewish. Yeah, it, it's some unintended consequence of being questioning uh social justice minded people. Also, well, yeah, that's another Jewish joke about the guy, you know, asked for the, the blind, it says, I don't, they, they want to, about to execute some Jews. Uh, at the end of the story, his friend says, take the blindfold, don't make waves, right? <laughs> like, like, there's this constant thing about the Jews not wanting to make waves, wanting to be accepted, psychologically fragile, I guess, as any people might be. It's in their DNA to be Democrats and always on the side of whatever is liberal. The younger generation of Jews has no idea the basic ABC facts of the conflict. So they don't even know, for instance, I've said this before, they don't even know that the occupied territories were occupied as a result of an attack on Israel, which is it's a prof profound fact to know 
So they've internalized the notion that they're bad and have, they've kind of made Afrikaners out of us. And it's an ugly psychological equation. And it all adds up to this. And, and, they, and this is also Jewish. And they will dismiss like the evangelicals or Christian people who support Israel say, well, they all support the Jews. Well, they only support us because they're religious. Well, that's why the Jews support. Like, why, why do the Jews support Israel? A lot of them support it because it's religious. But, but like, who would look that gift horse in the mouth? So they, they won't even take the, the, the support from the people who support them. They want them. the hat, too. Yeah, you know, know, bring yeah, the yeah. Uh, we're going to leave it there, Noam Dwarman. Okay, can I tell you one other thing? Yes, you yeah. can tell me one other thing. I, about my politics. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to bring, so I, I uncovered, just before I came here, yes, I figured you asked my politics, I didn't, I didn't shoehorn this. I was actually- now, this is kind of a Finkelsteinian moment. When you unfurl, it looks like a couple of hundred pages there, but- Well, yeah, I, was, I was say that I was always pretty MAGA. Um, and in 2000, not in the MAGA sense it is now, okay. But I, I always, Trump themes, not Trump, not the, you know, the obvious ridiculousness of Trump, reverberated with me uh, for a long time. And in 2000... What, what do you mean by that? The idea that America is great or that... You, you, I'll, I'll say, you know. So in 2010, before I had a family, I had thought about, I was restless. I thought about running for Senate. Um, there was that awkward time when Gillibrand had come in and I thought she was vulnerable. And I, Pat Cadell remember, the, was a big supporter of mine. I had a meeting with Joe Trippi and Dick Morris and whatever it was. And he asked me to write out, you know, where was I coming from? And I found it the other day. And it was pretty similar to things that Trump was saying. And I, I just, can, can I read a few? You Please. can cut it out. Yes. I, so um, John Adams in his thoughts on government wrote that our legislature should be a miniature, should be in miniature an exact portrait of the people at large. It should, I think, feel, reason, and act like them. I wrote, nevertheless, we have suffered for years with an entrenched group of uninspired elitist politicians who clearly do not think, feel, and reason like us. This is like, and I wrote, um, America has transformed the world, yet now we are told that we are, we are the ones that need to be transformed as if we should repudiate and apologize the last hundred years of American history. And then I read one more thing. Virtually every major innovation, every great invention or industry of the last hundred years, uh, I'm, I'm trying to shorten it, I'm making it longer. Last hundred years in America, uh, began in America, we need to unleash, unleash the creative and innovative forces of the American people. It's fashionable in certain circles to believe that our best days are behind us. New York construction workers built the Empire State Building in just one year and 45 days using 1920s technology during a recession. Yet today, almost 10 years later, there is still a hole in the ground at, grand, at ground zero. In a different time, our leaders would have rebuilt the towers and added a few extra stories as a message to our enemies. We will not be defeated. But today we accept paralysis as a fact of life. We have to ask ourselves, are we ready to accept that America can no longer build Empire State Buildings? So this is all very Trumpish stuff. But you, you're not gonna vote for Trump. No, I'm not gonna vote for Trump, no. But I just think it's interesting, people say, where did Trump come from? And I recall that I was having a lot of those thoughts. This is 2010, six years or five years before Trump ran for president. He was just the one who picked up on it. And he's a very imperfect messenger and he, and he ended up discrediting, to some extent, some of these ideas for a certain period of time. But I do think, and I think libertarians basically agree with that. So you can't get anything done anymore, right? So anyway. All right. Thank you. Well, we're done here. Okay. Noam Dwarman, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you. Thank you.